Oh, still have questions, hopefully. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, just to give you a little bit of a background then. Um, in the UK, we have obviously the National Health Service. So this covers, and our area covers England, so part of the United Kingdom, Scotland, and, and Wales, and Northern Ireland, etc. So we, we look after England as part of that. Now, uh, on your screen there, you can just see kind of where we sit within that. But so the National Ambulance Service uh, Resilience Unit, which is the, the team that I work for, work directly to NHS England. And as Elena said, we look after the national specialist interoperable capabilities. Because around the country, there are 10 different ambulance services and arguably, arguably 11 if you count the Isle of Wight, which is one of the off islands um, where the ambulance service comes under the hospital there. But generically speaking, there's 10 ambulance services managed uh, regionally but under NHS England. Now to ensure in the event of a major incident where two or three ambulance services have to come together, to ensure that all of their systems that are do, they're doing for the response for that big incident, that national incident, is coordinated and they're working uh, with the same PPE to the same standard operating procedures, etc. That's NARU's role, so we coordinate that. So it is focused specifically on those specialist areas. Uh, and as Elena said, the head of this area response team, SORT team, mass casualties, and command and control. Okay, um, we work as well, and, and those interoperable capabilities are based on what really is seen as the risks in the country. Uh, and for that, and it's open source, uh, we have the National Risk Register. Behind this, which is not open source, there is a security risk register. And within this, uh, obviously, the, the uh, it identifies all of the things that really could negatively affect the country in a big way. Now, I don't know about yourselves, but like a lot of countries, we kind of got caught out a little bit by COVID. Um, it, nobody saw it coming. Um, well, actually, they did see it coming. Nationally, we saw it coming. Uh, and it's, it was identified here, really, under pandemic diseases in that national risk register. So uh, we've been preparing for this for some time. Arguably not for COVID. Probably our biggest fear is probably a pandemic flu because of the death rate would be significantly higher. Um, but it's in there, along with all of the other things you would expect from terrorist attacks to earthquakes to other elements are all within that national risk register. So although it's, its likelihood is not particularly high, its impact is, and I think we all saw that worldwide, obviously, with the, the effect of, um, of COVID. So what are we doing to prepare that? So across these 10 ambulance services, there are a number of, of half teams. I'll just skip on to the little world, world map down the bottom there. And I say world map because it covers England uh, and Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. So the red dots, Heart team. So there's 15 of uh, those. Nick, Nick, I'm sorry, uh, you are still on the first slide. Really? Yeah. I'm, I'm scrolling through here. If you <laughs> click on the left upper corner from the beginning, and then probably uh, you can. I'm working on a number of screens here. You see, it's a problem. So. Or you can stop sharing and then start sharing again. That might also help. That will work. I might just stop sharing and start sharing again if that's fine. Just to make sure, because I've got some lovely pictures to share with you. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Okay, I think we that. I think it just threw me out then as well, didn't it? Let me see you here. Okay. It's coming. Okay, how about now? 
Can you see your hand? Uh, yeah. Now we can see your slides and your notes. So and you my notes. And your notes, yes. Well, the notes will all be wrong because this is based off a uh, presentation that I gave to a, a conference in Canada on Salisbury. So ignore the notes if you can see the notes. From the current slide, maybe? Let's try from the beginning, see if that cleans the notes off. Otherwise, you'll all be seeing the notes, but I can say ignore them. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd be finding out everything I thought about the uh, Salisbury uh, incident. <laughs> now then, do you yep. have... Steal your notes. notes. But if you go back, actually, that this will be work. Better. You can just uh, click from the uh, from the left side, from one slide to another. The one uh, you showed previously. I'm, I'm doing that. Are you getting a picture of the National Risk Register now? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. And if you got the scale, if you like, showing all of the. Yeah, that will work. Okay. Yeah. Right, folks. In that case, I apologize. Ignore the notes. Like I say, they won't be relevant to this presentation. This is it is a, okay. A slide set uh, I, I use and uh, dropped the uh, the HCID stuff into it from a presentation I gave at a uh, CBRN conference in Canada. So, hello to all my friends in Canada. Especially the uh, the gentleman that got up at three o'clock this morning. Thank you very much. I uh, hope Vancouver and British Columbia is looking after you. Um, so I'll backtrack slightly, but just uh, the, as I said, the uh, the National Risk Register identifies the risks. High consequence infectious diseases are in there. Pandemics are in there. Uh, so it's nothing that we shouldn't be surprised about. So heart teams they're strategically located across the country. Uh, there's 15 of them across these 10 ambulance services. Some ambulance services get two heart teams, so, and that could be based on geography, um, or it could be based on population density. So, for example, London has two. Um, the northeast of the country has one, but the northwest of the country, where you've got Liverpool and Manchester and the risks associated with them, uh, things like the Manchester Arena attack, et cetera, that has two heart teams. And they cover, as pictured in here, things like urban search and rescue. Um, they cover support to security operations. They do water response or swift water rescue technician training, all safe working at height train. Um, and obviously, a primary role is around the CBRN response. Um, but part of their specialist role as well is to transfer high consequence infectious diseases around the country to the high level infectious units because we don't have very many of them. Um, and again, they're based kind of strategically in London and in the north of the country. Um, in addition to that, we look after the specialist decontamination unit uh, teams, which are called SORT. Uh, so we have those strategically located. The SORT teams are a bit different to the heart teams. The heart teams are 24 seven, uh, seven days a week. And there's six heart paramedics in each team on duty across uh, the whole of the country times 15, so each of the, them has at least six. We are looking at uplifting those numbers slightly at the moment. The SORT teams, these are ambulance staff that are on ambulances out there working today um, and that can be taken off those vehicles if available to respond, to assist with things like the decontamination or surge numbers, obviously in the event of a terrorist attack involving firearms, etc. they're trained to deal with those. Okay, so NARU, our team, quite small, but we look at our sit within the operations team. And as the standards manager, um, I actually look after all of the safe system of work governance. So all of the really exciting stuff that I wanted to do when I became a paramedic and look after patients, I don't do a huge amount of that anymore. They've promoted me away from patients. Uh, quite Probably quite a good thing for some of the patients, to be fair. But now I look after all of the, uh, the guidance and the standard operating procedures and things like that. Our role operationally, though, is in the event of a national incident, we will staff up and stand up the National Ambulance Coordination Centre. And also there is a strategic and tactical NARU officer on call 24-7 as well. So in the event of a high consequence infectious disease, we will get involved. Now, the reason we'll get involved is because they normally consist of a heart team being deployed, but also a heart team taking patients across boundaries. So across a number of ambulance services to reach one of the high level uh, infectious units uh, in the country. 
So how do we do that? So as I said, we have our heart teams, um, at least uh, six. Um, the problem that we've had historically though, is because of the PPE restrictions, our previous PPE ensemble, we could only work for two hours in that PPE. And that was really based not specifically on problems with breakthrough with the PPE, but if you're in the back of an ambulance with a patient and you're wearing uh, high level infectious unit PPE, then um, you, it's more around your comfort and safety and things like that. So the hydration and, and using the toilet and all those kind of business, we limited it to a two hour period. Now, what that meant was that if we had a patient that needed to travel from uh, Cornwall up to London, that journey could be five hours, but it would have to be broken down into three legs. That would involve three different heart teams, potentially, where because we'd have to swap the patient, uh, the staff in and out of the ambulance. Um, the other issue we had, obviously, we, what we were using was a stripped down ambulance. So we took an ambulance and took all the stuff out of it. Um, and only put back in what was specifically required to clinically manage that patient because the entire ambulance would be effectively be contaminated as a result of that. This is where, obviously, um, a number of years ago, we started looking at patient isolators. Uh, and the Epi Shuttle was the one that was selected by NHS England for us to adopt with our hazardous area response teams. And that obviously brings the benefits that we're all aware of and know of. I'll come back onto that in a sec. Um, as I said, my role is around the safe system of work. Nationally, all of the heart teams, even though they're in different ambulance services, work to our guidance and our standard operating procedures. And that's managed through a central system, such as pictured on the screen here, um, which includes all of the standardized equipment through the equipment data sheets. So if a heart paramedic from the north of the country joins a heart team in the south of the country, they're trained to the same standards, they're trained to the, to the same uh, level, they're all wearing the same PPE and the interoperability is there. In addition, this system allows us to raise any issues nationally through the safety alert system. Somebody finds a new piece of kit, which paramedics do spend a lot of time trawling the internet, looking at things that are shiny, uh, and new fancy bits of kit. They can ask them to be introduced through the change management system. If that's a system that's then assessed nationally, and if agreed, it's not just that team that gets it. Every single team will get exactly the same piece of equipment or new system or new procedure that works through. Now, we like checklists um, because we're dealing with paramedics at three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, and we're, we can all forget things. So in addition to the very good EpiGuard uh, checklists that were delivered as part of the training package, we've enhanced them locally because of our local clinical requirements and things like that. So we have a pre-deployment uh, deployment checklist and, and things to assist us uh, in preparation of deployment of the Epi shuttle. And then I will see it as well en route uh, to, the, to the patient and then uh, through the, the whole transfer and post transfer as well. Um, part of our system as well for everything, we have generic rescue plans. And these include all our high consequence infectious disease transfers as well. And these are just checklists in the event of something going wrong. Um, and that could be involving the shuttle or it could not. Uh, and it covers things such as, you know, a breakdown of a vehicle with a patient in the back, uh, something along those lines. So uh, a number of years ago now, uh, I'm trying to think how many years ago really, it was the beginning of the pandemic, um, the, the EPI shuttle was presented to us to, to use for uh, originally it was when COVID was first introduced so if you can all remember that far back um, uh, the the low numbers of COVID patients that we had at the time COVID was classified as a high consequence infectious disease so it was down to heart to transport them and also we had concerns around the Isles of Scilly which are an off island from England down the very far southwest that if we had a patient over there how were we going to get them back to the mainland so the Epi Shuttle offered the solution for that. Now, as we found, the problem that we had and some of the challenges, and this is why uh, the screen, this screen and a number of other uh, entitled challenges, is there's no one size fits all. Uh, and that's quite literal, I suppose, when it comes to uh, putting the patient in an isolator. But the, the, um, the uh, problems that we found as we went through the training in the introduction 
uh, we were able to solve, uh, and also uh, that wasn't in isolation, that was in partnership, not just with other units using the Epi Shuttle, but with, with Epi Guard themselves. Um, so the panacea, I suppose, we, almost there's, there's two groups of patients that we found were, were very suitable for the Epi Shuttle. And that is a ventilated patient, because you can lie them down and, and knock them out and manage them quite successfully, or the fully, um, fully conscious and compliant patient as well. And then there's a bit of a group of patients in the middle there. And predominantly, I suppose, our, our worst case patients are the ones that, are, that we're not going to um, sedate and ventilate, but need to be sat up and on high flow oxygen. That small group of patients isn't, isn't we found isn't suitable for the Epi shuttle, and we still have procedures in place to take them in the back of an open ambulance where we can manage them clinically uh, as such um, with that as well. Um, the other group of patients I'll come on to in a second, which is um, pediatric intensive care transfers as well, uh, which this slide pictures. So piece of work we're doing um, and is still really ongoing is around our, our intensive care to intensive care transfers. Um, Historically, pre-COVID, there was a bit of a belief that if a patient had a high consequence infection disease, such as the 2014 Ebola outbreak, and I know that we are having regular annual out uh, Ebola outbreaks since, but that was one that um, got our attention here in the UK because of the British medical team we were sending over there, but also uh, the healthcare worker that came back to the UK with Ebola. Um, so, so that got our attention a little bit. But the concept, I suppose, the perception that we had uh, nationally was that if somebody had something like Ebola and they were so poorly they needed to be in, in intensive care, there really wasn't a, a huge amount to be gained from transferring them from a, a regional hospital to a high level infectious unit hospital because their survivability uh, was going to be incredibly low anyway. Now, COVID changed that up a little bit, and we've had a number of cases since in the last couple of years, including Lassa fever, uh, where actually uh, we've had patients um, who are uh, critically critical care patients, and we've had to put into place uh, systems to manage those as well. And that's still ongoing because we've worked through the adult ones, but now we're looking, going through the process of working out what to do with pediatric and, uh, and child transfers for critically unwell patients with a high consequence of HFC disease. Pictured here is a critical care transfer trolley. Um, we found that the Epi shuttle fits nicely on that. Uh, and what it means is that all of the syringe drivers and uh, the, the Hamilton T1 uh, T2 ventilator um, will fit in their system as the critical care team are used to moving these patients. Because what we're looking at is a multidisciplinary uh, transfer of a patient. So it's a heart team providing the uh, epi shuttle and the uh, HCID PPE and specialist knowledge around decontamination, etc. And then a, three critical care clinicians, two going in the back of the ambulance with a heart member of staff who actually look after the clinical needs of the patient. Now, the problem, the only problem really we found with this is in the UK, we've started transferring back to van-based ambulances which are much smaller so this is the, the system within a what would be called a normal ambulance in old money uh, which are the box shaped ambulances but they've got a lot more room in the back and the problem with the uh, critical care transfer trolley is it sits quite high one of the other issues with that is when you put the, uh, the isolate on top of it and put it alongside a patient's bed it's fine if you're six foot seven uh, like myself um, but if you're a relatively smaller member of staff, transferring the patient across into uh, the epi shuttle and conversely at the other end is a much higher working position. So that's a piece of work we're doing around steps and things like that to make sure we can do that effectively as well. So with every solution that we come up with, we find two or three challenges which offer us uh, the ability to have some fun looking at different ways to overcome those. So we're looking at the process with critical care specific patient transfers, um, ambulances that are pre-identified that are big enough still to be able to take the critical care transfer trolley itself. Not a problem if we're just taking a paramedic care level patient, because we'll do that in a normal ambulance, 
and using the, the brackets um, with the ratchet strap system, we can put the FB shuttle onto any type of stretcher that we have. Because what we found as well is across the 10 different ambulance services, they're using two or three different stretchers, as you would. Um, so we found problems with the uh, specific brackets that if we had a striker bracket, flew a patient up to Newcastle, took them out the back of the aircraft to put them into the ambulance to take them uh, on that, that tertiary transfer to the hospital, to the HLIU, we couldn't fit the actual brackets uh, onto the stretch, so that caused some issues. Now, EpiGuard um, responded to that and developed this bracket, which we've adopted across all of ours now. We have the odd little challenge. The bottom small picture there shows the, um, the drip stand holder, which we have to lift and move off uh, to, to allow us to uh, um, fit the system correctly onto that stretcher. Um, and the other thing we have to remember as well is to actually take the stretcher uh, mattress with us as well, because part of our generic rescue plan, if we had a critical failure uh, or some issue where we needed to pop the lid, we may have to transfer the uh, patient in, on, uh, in an open system. One of the good things that COVID did for us, and it didn't do a huge amount of good things for us, but from a Nara perspective, it opened a lot of doors around the working with partner agencies for transferring high level infectious uh, disease patients, where historically those doors were, were not closed, but they were certainly more challenging to open. So we've developed as a result, a very good partnership with uh, His Majesty's Coast Guard uh, to use their aircraft to be able to transport, transport patients. You can't rely on these things lastminute.com. You have to train and prepare for these. One of the issues the Coast Guard found was the weight of the EpiGuard pushing onto their floor. They needed to, um, to be able to strip, strap it down properly and also uh, spread that weight to load as well, which uh, they do literally using a couple of bits of plywood. It's nothing expensive. It's nothing uh, sexy or very uh, difficult to get hold of. But without trialing it and without getting approval through the uh, UK Civil Aviation Authority, we couldn't do that. Um, and they have two different aircraft types as well. So we've got two different systems. The one pictured is their smallest one. Um, and the, so the other aircraft we use in S92 is much larger, um, but we have the ability now, should we require it, to be able to transfer a patient by air um, across the UK. And that helps with the issues with the islands based off places like Northern Scotland, but also of the southwest of the country as well. And then we have these high level uh, isolation units. So we've started doing a lot more work with them in them because this is a, uh, what we call a Trexler unit. It's not, it's not brand new, uh, you know, modern technology um, per se, but it's the one that is commonly used across the unit, um, across the, uh, uh, England that we have here. So, We've had to, to start doing a lot more exercise and training with them and their staff, because now in the old days, what we would do is deliver effectively a patient in the back of an ambulance to the outside of the hospital. We would then be met by the hospital team, effectively down the side alley of the hospital at a, at a, at a doorway to screen and put uh, around the outside. We would transfer the patient onto the hospital bed and the hospital bed would be pushed up through the hospital, uh, through the lift, etc., to the to the HLIU, the high level isolation unit. The hospital's problem, obviously, is they have to close down a lot of corridors to facilitate that internal movement and then decontaminate following that as well. So they would lose part of their hospital for quite a bit to facilitate that. The, they like the Epi Shuttle because what we can do is we can take the patient directly all the way up to the high level isolation unit and they don't have to shut and clean down uh, the, the hospital as they would have previously had to. Some of the challenges, obviously, even when we get in there, we're now in the back, of, we're now in, our, in our, an isolation unit. Um, we pop the lid, we need to transfer the patient, host them effectively through this quite small hole. And anything that goes in there, stays in there for the duration of that patient's uh, stay in hospital. 
So we have to be very cognizant and careful about not putting in things such as scoot stretches and such like. So we found a standard carry sheet with handles uh, is the most effective way to both post them through, but also to manage the, the waste and the material and the equipment after as well. It does create a small concern, I suppose, that we're having now uh, a stretcher as pictured picture here in an environment with the lid off where if it's airborne, it, how are we going to decontaminate the stretcher afterwards when we get the patient out? We've got the issues of decontamination of the medical equipment. If, this, if you imagine this with the uh, critical care intensive care trolley with all of the medical equipment underneath. Um, but obviously what this doesn't show, because this is purely just been offered up to the photograph to offer the height, is the shrouding. Um, so we're doing a little bit more work on clear shrouding to go around the, the, uh, the stretcher to protect the stretcher and the medical equipment from any contamination, but obviously it also allow the clinicians to continue to monitor the patient because they can see through the clear shrouding uh, to, the, uh, to the cardiac monitor to the uh, rest of the equipment syringe drivers, et cetera, why state transfer is taking place. Okay, um, so we've got a couple of minutes left um, on the time, I think, two, three minutes. So the, the um, uh, sorry, I'd like to finish with this one as well, because we concentrate, uh, we, we concentrate on Ebola and, and the really high consequence ones. Um, bird flu we've had here in the UK a couple of years ago, and this gentleman contracted bird flu uh, he, he, um, he had pet chickens and ducks and the 41 he had in the house. Um, I'd always like to finish a little bit with him because of his name. His name was uh, Alan Gosling um, and a baby goose here is called the Gosling. So it struck me as being kind of ironic that he should catch bird flu with a name such as Gosling. Okay, so um, that's it really on the presentation slides. Like I say, in summary, uh, with all of our patient groups, we know the challenges. There isn't a panacea, there isn't one size fits all. However, the Epi Shuttle has given us another tool to our toolbox to transfer these patients, which allows us to transfer patients over greater distances using smaller numbers of teams. So, for example, uh, we transferred a monkeypox patient um, when they first, uh, when we had that first outbreak here last year, a year before, maybe even now, even we moved over a year. Uh, so we transferred a patient there from uh, London up to Newcastle to the high level isolation unit up there from one isolation to another isolation unit to decompress the London area because the isolation units were getting full. Uh, and that was, you know, over six hours um, in the back of an epi shuttle and the patient was absolutely fine for that journey. Uh, we did proactively um, give them some antiemetics so they, they didn't feel sick for the journey and uh, a very mild oral sedation just to, to, to make them relax a little bit more and enjoy the journey a little bit more. But that was undertaken by one part to ship people uh, to, to achieve that. Whereas without the epi shuttle, that would have taken at least three, possibly four heart teams uh, and would have uh, been a lot more complicated with a lot more vehicles requiring decontamination and all of the other issues associated with that. Okay, right. That is my presentation. I'm very yes, happy to Nick, take uh, questions. Yes, you have a question. Uh, can you see it in the Q&A? Okay, yes. Yeah. So the question to me, I'll verbalize this in case people can't. When you yeah. transfer critically ill HCIDA patients, how many members of your, of your, does your team consist of? So we, we run with a six person hazardous area response team. So we'll have a team leader as part of that. And in fact, uh, I can probably answer that with a slide as well. Um, and that consists of a team leader um, and uh, five other paramedics. They're all paramedics. I'm not sure if I'm sharing the slide or not. Uh, but the in the back of the ambulance, um, obviously, we have uh, the patient care team. Um, and there's normally one person in the back of the ambulance with the patient, but it depends on the patient's needs and requirements. Bearing in mind, you're not just looking clinically after a patient, you're looking after the equipment as well. Uh, so there'll be a team leader with, with one of the other paramedics driving them so they can do all of the other elements. Uh, the ambulance itself with the patient in the back 
And then in support, one of our hazardous area response team vehicles, which is a uh, either a converted um, Mercedes van um, or uh, such like, which has got the emergency team and the safe undressing procedure team in it. So that's two more paramedics that, that are there to perform the safe undressing procedure. But in the event of an emergency with the ambulance, such as uh, the ambulance being involved in a crash or uh, something happening uh, in the back of the ambulance because the team in the back of the ambulance, the paramedic in the back of the ambulance is not wearing PPE now. Uh, they've got the patient in an epi shuttle. Um, they can now uh, operate in normal uniform. So in the event of a problem um, where we would have to lift the lid of the epi shuttle, they will retreat and the emergency team will quickly don PPE and enter the back of the ambulance to continue looking after that patient. So team of six. Thank you. Michael, something to add before we go to the next uh, presentation? Mention quickly, we had a question regarding uh, disinfection procedures, uh, which I've answered in the chat, but maybe if you uh, just want to say briefly a little bit about, about what procedures you use for the disinfection. Yeah, so there's a... Um, uh, I'm just sorry, I'm just uh, quickly reading your response and you're absolutely right there. So yeah, we, we have a hard and a soft reset option effectively. So something like a monkeypox patient, we have the option to do a soft reset and we'll use parasitic acid. Um, and obviously we're using that anyway, because once we put the patient in and close the lid down, that's going to get a spray down, uh, get a little bit of soap time and a wipe down with parasitic acid wipes as well, which are the red clinel wipes as well as we use here in the UK. Um, so that that is a that's an on, the decontamination is an ongoing pr process even during the, uh, the the whole transfer. So as soon as you've um, been and collected a patient, you'll you'll get you're starting those kind of processes as well. Um, but as well as that, um, the health and safety executive in the UK through their laboratories tested independently tested the system. Because uh, no offence to Epigard, but we don't trust anybody any manufacturers. We uh, we want to check these things out ourselves as well. So we had the, uh, the decontamination system using hydrogen peroxide, um, uh, which is done through the high level infectious units themselves, uh, uh, tested and that worked perfectly. So uh, what we'll do is when we leave the patient at the high level infectious unit, we also leave the epi shuttle for a few days because they will clean it for us there. And then we'll just go back and, and we and get the component parts to build it back up again. We've got 15 of them in the country, so we've got the ability to, to allow us to do that and lose a couple of days without one of the teams having an epi shuttle because there's another 14 available to us 24-7, uh, so that's not a problem for that. I just mentioned that that's also, it's a very good example of, of the importance of the customer dialogue because we initially had parasitic acid as, as the one solution that we had validated. Um, and then through your request and the work that we did with the HSC, um, we then developed this the second uh, validated procedure um, to allow you to use the systems that you were comfortable with and, and that you knew. Yeah, uh, indeed. And, and this is, uh, I don't know what it's like around the rest of the world, but certainly in the UK um, and certainly with the thing, things that are, are very particularly dangerous around CBRN, et cetera. And this sits under our hazmat response really for that. Um, we will look to validate and cross-reference and get independent perception as well. So, for example, the, the actual epi shuttle went to the SDL, which is the Defence Science and Technology Laboratories at Porton Down, and they tested the epi shuttle for us against biological uh, hazards as well. So um, it's not that we don't trust you, it's just that uh, our processes mean we need that extra validation as well. Trust and verify, I suppose. Absolutely. Uh, Indeed. There are a couple other questions there, uh, Nicholas, do you see? Yes, problem? indeed. So when a patient is coming to the HLIU, transporting the upper shuttle, where is the patient moved to the HLIU in that station? Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So no, we take them right into the, yeah, we do take them right into the isolation room itself. Um, uh, and they're transferred within the actual room now. I said previously they weren't they were transferred outside the hospital down a side road and if it was raining or poor weather that really didn't work very well as a uh, uh for the patient 
and especially nowadays with drones in the air and lots of CCTV and people with filming with cameras, we don't want to be doing that in an open environment. So we take the patient now directly to the isolation room and do the transfer in there itself. And then uh, next question from the same uh, person. If so, uh, is the epishot allowed to be removed from the isolation room? Yeah, really good question. The answer is yes, it, it is taken out of the isolation room into a side room. They have specific side rooms where all of the equipment is put uh, to be decontaminated. So it's still a protected area. Uh, it's still classified as a you know, contaminated area. It's not in the isolation room itself anymore. So it's not uh, in the way of any clinical care or ongoing treatment for that patient who may be there for several weeks. Um, it is a, in a side room where the, everything really that gets, gets removed and put into there. Okay. Excellent. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Nick. Uh, if you have uh, uh, time to stay a little bit longer with us, maybe there will be more questions that you could answer uh, in today. Uh, also, now you can stop sharing the presentation. Excellent. Apologies for the uh, technical issues earlier, folks. I should have stopped sharing. You have indeed. Uh, I'll, I'll even turn my face off so you don't have to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Nick. Um, yeah, uh, I would like to mention that uh, Nick uh, is the only presenter that uh, was uh, talking live. And uh, now we have two more presenters. We ordered uh, their presentations. And now I will share uh, videos. Unfortunately, they will not be able to answer all the questions online, as Nick uh, just did. But uh, we're going to collect all the questions and get back to you, uh, get back to you later. So uh, the next uh, presenter. Just give me a second. Yeah. I'm sure sound is over there. This is not the video. Just a short introduction of uh, our next uh, presenter, Dr. Demetrius Piros, uh, Director of Medical Services of National Center of Emergency Care, ACAB, in Greece, and uh, the president of the European Emergency Number Association. He is an active aeromedical uh, evacuations doctor since 1994. Uh, he was co-founder of Greek uh, chapter of uh, Doctors Without Borders in uh, 1990 and vice president of it uh, for 10 years. Deputy chief medical officer for the Athens 2004 Olympics and Paralympics and uh, past president of the World Association of Disaster and Emergency Medicine. He has been repeatedly honored by several governments and organizations for his medical uh, intervention during disasters, such as in Armenia in 1988, Afghanistan in 1993, Liberia in 1991, 93, and 96, in Iraq in 1997, and uh, Korea in 1998, and in Turkey in 1999. So it's my honor to share his experience with you today. Uh, Hi, everybody. The name is Dimitri Piros, and I'm the Director of Medical Services for the National Center of Emergency Care uh, here in Athens, uh, Greece. I'm also the President of the European Emergency Number Association, which is a small uh, NGO based in Brussels, uh, Belgium, 
that promotes the single uh, single number in uh, Europe, uh, 112, as the three-digit emergency number. Let's go to our topic, which is aeromedical evacuation of COVID-19 patients from the islands to mainland Greece um, using uh, the epicycle. Uh, as an introduction, uh, ECAB, which is the acronym for the National Center of Emergency Care in Greece, is the sole countrywide public provider of emergency pre-hospital care in Greece. So there is one uh, nationwide ambulance service in, uh, in Greece. An interesting fact is that there is also one police force and one firefighting force uh, nationwide in Greece. The uh, ambulance service serves the uh, entire country, and we have approximately 5,000 uh, personnel uh, serving uh, in the ambulance service. Um, just as an introduction, some demographics of Greece that will show the, the problem uh, that we have regarding uh, healthcare and emergency pre-hospital care uh, in Greece. So Greece is a small country with a population of 11,000 approximately, whereas the greater Athens area, Attica area, has half, almost half of the population. However, during uh, the summer, we have uh, more than 30 million tourists and not to forget migrant and refugees and the number fluctuate of migrants and refugees um, coming to our shores. Um, if you ask uh, the Navy, um, they will tell you that we have 9,841 islands in Greece, but they're countering every single rock that sticks out from the surface of the sea. There is uh, 114 inhabited islands, and um, during summer, there are islands that the population um, increases by tenfold. For example, uh, a, an island like Santorini, which has about 15,000 inhabitants during summer, easily it has 150,000 um, inhabitants. And therefore comes the problem of providing uh, healthcare for this um, increase of the population, but also in general uh, covering uh, healthcare for the population in the islands throughout the year. Clearly, there are cases that the health infrastructures in the islands cannot cope with, hence the aeromedical uh, evacuations. Currently, the aeromedical evacuations in Greece are covered by four bases, which you see the little yellow stars um, in the map of uh, Greece. Um, I have to uh, explain a little bit that uh, it's a peculiar um, cooperation, civilian military cooperation for the air medical evacuations in Greece, because we use flight and maintenance crew by the Hellenic Armed Forces uh, general staff and the medical crew and medical equipment are from the ambulance service. So this is, this is how the cooperation uh, works. As you know, we were faced with the COVID-19 crisis and the need for medevacs of COVID patients. However, since we had um, military aircraft, helicopters and airplanes, to work with, we, fa we were faced with a unique problem. The Air Force wanted the aircraft to be available immediately following the air medical evacuation for their own use. Therefore, it was not possible to have a patient transferred inside the aircraft and then have the aircraft disinfected, sterilized, whatever. Um, we had to find a solution, and um, the solution was 
the use of negative pressure uh, chambers. Initially, that also meant that we need to use large military airplanes and helicopters, so like C-130, C-27J, uh, these are large cargo planes, Chinook helicopters, Super Puma helicopters, and NH-90 helicopters. So we wanted uh, large military airplanes and helicopters in order to accommodate the negative pressure chambers. Here is the uh, C-130, here is the C-27. This is the inside of a C-130, and you can see the back of a C-130 here. And we come to initially using the plastic negative pressure chambers. We had uh, two plastic negative ch pressure chambers that we were bought uh, during the Ebola crisis, and we had them in the, air in the main base of the air medical uh, evacuations. Um, however, it was uh, very obvious from the first um, air medical evacuations using the plastic negative pressure chambers that um, we had a number of problems uh, using them, um, mostly the claustrophobia of the patients, but also overall uh, use uh, of them. So here comes a picture from um, a conference, uh, a medical conference in Madrid, Spain, that I attended and I had taken that picture and I immediately thought of uh, EpiShuttle and uh, got in contact uh, to get uh, more details. Um, it was obvious that this was something that um, would solve uh, a lot of our problems, not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, and um, we needed them uh, as fast as we can. What happened was that we were lucky to have a um, donation from individuals and institutions of seven epi shuttles. Otherwise, it would take too much to order them through the public uh, channels. So there were individuals uh, and institutions that bought seven epi shuttles for use by the ambulance service. And uh, this immediately changed the game regarding transport of COVID patients using um, aircraft from the Air Force, as I previously mentioned. So what happened is we spread those epi shuttles as you can see in all four bases and uh, following a crash course of uh, training via webinar um, remember it was in the middle of the covid crisis nobody could travel nobody could uh, um, be together and, and all that um, so uh, we had a webinar uh, we read the manuals uh, from the main base, and then we made sure that uh, as, uh, as we spread the epi shuttles, uh, somebody from the main base would follow the epi shuttle and, and give uh, uh, introduction and how to be used in the other uh, three bases uh, as well. So very soon, into the COVID crisis, we had the epi shuttles as a, a great tool um, to solve the problem that I mentioned earlier. Now, here are some pictures from our main base. The ISO box that you see here was not uh, um, before the COVID crisis. As soon as we bought the epi shuttles, we realized that uh, 
we need uh, a separate uh, entity to store them and clean them. As you can see, there are two doors here. One is the door for the storage and the other is the store, the door, uh, apologies, the door for the clinic chamber, if you like. So here is the storage of the three uh, episodes. And you can see that we also store uh, suits and we also store uh, ex spare, uh, spare parts for the epi shuttle. You can also see some negative chambers at the back, uh, plastic ones, just in case. But here are the three uh, epi shuttles uh, from the main base uh, in. Uh, in uh, LFC's military airport, very close to Athens. I uh, will show you uh, another picture, which is uh, a blow up of the previous one, because I want to draw your attention to the um, fact that um, we have pre-installed all the cables, all the cables that will be needed including IV extensions, including blood pressure uh, cable, including uh, SpO2 cable, uh, capnography cable, uh, ECG cables. Everything is pre-installed uh, in order to have the capsule ready. And obviously, um, if the patient is intubated, we pre-install the extensions that we use for the respirator. So uh, when we start an aeromedical evacuation, uh, taking off from our base to go to an island, uh, everything is already pre-installed in terms of extensions uh, to hook the, the, the patient up. Now, uh, some interesting, uh, interesting figures uh, from March uh, 20th, to February 22. Um, as you can see, um, the graph is uh, aeromedical evacuation of patients using Epi Shuttle. And um, if we take it by year, uh, unfortunately, I had official statistics up to 2nd uh, of 2022 you will see that we had uh, 341 COVID-19 medevacs with the epi shuttle. Uh, and I have to tell you that uh, we, are, we have reached uh, the 400 mark by now, um, a, a rough estimate. And um, out of all those cases, we had to open the capsule only in one case to uh, resuscitate uh, the patient. So uh, a great tool for us uh, overall, uh, a proven tool because we have, um, uh, I believe, a large number of medevacs uh, using the epi shuttle out of necessity. And, uh, but this is uh, what it is. And um, we were able to uh, provide the aircraft to the Air Force immediately after um, uh, each uh, air medical uh, evacuation. A lot of difficult cases, a lot of cases that you have to make uh, quick decisions on how to, to deal with uh, the patients. This is a seven-year-old uh, child that was lethargic and um, it had uh, with uh, COVID and we had to uh, put him inside the epi shuttle and um, it was uh, the decision had to be taken uh, do you sedate that child in case it wakes up or you do not sedate the child um, uh, because it was already lethargic um, a lot of cases that we could uh, dis separately discuss them but uh, overall, as I said, only in one case out of uh, the 400 up to now, uh, we had to open uh, 
the epicycle to resuscitate uh, the patient. A lot of patients, out of those uh, 400, a lot of patients were already intubated um, because, as you can understand, in order to uh, to do an aeromedical evacuation, uh, the the patient had to be in a, such a state that could not be um, could not be dealt by the local uh, health facility in the island. So most of the cases were in critical condition. The other thing that was really helpful for the respiratory patient, as you know, was the uh, possibility of uh, reclining the, the back. That, uh, that was really a huge advantage compared to the plastic negative chamber. And um, uh, I have to say that uh, most of the patients that uh, we had, that were not uh, intubated, we had to, um, we had to sedate uh, even just a little bit, but uh, almost everybody got something um, to be on the, on the safe side. Um, so I guess uh, that's it. We were faced with a problem. We managed to find a solution, and uh, it was a solution that uh, provided us with uh, a valuable tool to solve uh, a problem that we had to solve. Um, just a quick um, at the end, uh, a, a quick info about the INA conference and exhibition in uh, Ljubljana, Slovenia in April this year, in case uh, anybody is interested to participate. And I would like to thank you for your attention uh, during my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, that was... Um presentation of Dr. Piros. I see that we have uh, more questions uh, coming. She's cool now. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get back to yeah to answering them. And uh, yeah, I will try to share again the video of our last presenter, uh, Dr. Sebastian Gauch. Uh, he has been flight doctor for many years and uh, he joined FAI uh, Air Ambulance Medical Direction in 2019. Uh, he works as a consultant anesthesiologist and uh, critical care specialist at uh, Christ Krankenhaus Mechernich in Germany. Uh, so, now, just a second. Yeah, this time it should be perfect. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Sebastian Gauch. Um, on behalf of uh, FAI Air Ambulance, we would like to share our experience with EpiShuttle with you. At first, a few introductory words regarding FAI Air Ambulance. Afterwards, um, I would like to show you how we use EpiShuttle and in the end give you two case reports um, and uh, summarize everything for you. So FAI is one of the largest air ambulance providers. Um, we accumulated um, more than 10,000 uh, hours per year of ambulance um, time. We are specialized on transcontinental and long haul air ambulance flights, uh, have our headquarters right in the center of Europe, uh, in Germany. Um, we have a fleet of Learjet 60, Challenger 604 and Global Express, currently 10 aircraft in air ambulance operation. 
Um, and during the pandemic, we conducted more than 300 uh, COVID-19 missions exclusively using PMIUs, portable medical isolation units. Uh, the vast majority of these cases was done using EpiGuard's EpiShuttle, especially, uh, or this is particularly true for all patients that fulfilled the criteria of being critically ill, including all ventilated cases. So consequently, uh, we have gained a lot of experience um, using this particular portable medical isolation units. Um, the three units in use are used on our Challenger fleet exclusively, and the Challenger 604 undoubtedly has become the major workhorse during the pandemic. And uh, this is because the Challenger aircraft uh, offers sufficient space for loading um, and mounting the shuttle, as well as additional equipment that's needed. So we operate all Epi Shuttle missions with a heavy medical crew, meaning that we have three individuals. Um, um, two paramedics, so one doctor or two doctors and one paramedic, because this has just proven effective in the safe handling of COVID-19 patients from a logistic as well as a hygienic perspective. This map outlines the challenges intercontinental range, giving us the opportunity of reaching many places non-stop. And this uh, facilitates a straightforward, uh, fast operation, so patients can be spared additional rotations. And especially during a pandemic, administrative and technical processes are optimized, which is undoubtedly extremely helpful. So consequently, in our opinion, Challenger and EpiShuttle proved to be a very strong, effective combination. Here we can see uh, our Challenger 604 Alpha Delta. This is one out of five aircraft of this type currently in our operation. So in the front part, we can see the ramp used for loading the Epi Shuttle um, in case the patient is not ambulatory. Um, once the patient is inside the shuttle, um, the shuttle will be mounted upon the ramp and slided into the aircraft. So the, the ramp you see here was developed by us and has proven quite safe and effective in loading the shuttle. It consists of four elements and each of this element can be stowed in, uh, separately, um, which is very important um, in order to fit into the aircraft. So in case the patient is ambulatory, we usually let the patient board the aircraft on his or her own. Um, and the aircraft is already prepared with the Epi Shuttle in the position it will remain in during the flight. The patient lies down on the stretcher part of the shuttle, then the lid will be closed by two members um, of uh, the med crew. Yeah. Um, we already get, got our supplemental um, uh, certificate for the Epi Shuttle. Um, so we see the Epi Shuttle in its in-flight position here. Um, the shuttle is secured by pins that fixate the shuttle on a cargo stretcher, which itself can be secured by the usual fixation system uh, on a spectrum med base. So this is what the setting actually looks like inside the aircraft. And uh, the STC means that the Epi Shuttle has become an integral part of the aircraft and is not just a piece of equipment that's brought along. Um, here you can see a patient um, who is in need of extended monitoring, IV medication and mechanical ventilation. And this leads me to the next slide. Um, and this includes the management of hoses, cables and lines. And this uh, is quite easy to do in the Epi Shuttle, to be honest. So first and most importantly, Everything has to be well prepared in advance before the patient even arrives. So we regularly use the empty legs that bring us to the patient for the standardized preparation of the shuttle. Um, as you see in the pictures, IV lines and monitoring will be inserted via the designated um, insertion port in the left lower part of the shuttle. So cables and lines are pulled through the rubber membrane, then positioned in certain areas of the shuttle. Uh, that allow easy and fast connection once the patient is in. So the ventilation hose will be inserted from the right lower side, as you can see in the picture. 
Um, we regularly prepare at least two IV lines, full monitoring and a ventilation hose, even if the patient is not ventilated yet. Um, and additionally, a bag containing emergency equipment such as endotracheal tubes, stuff used for laryngoscopy and so on. And this will be positioned in a well-reachable position within the shuttle. The first example um, of the case report is an ultra long haul mission um, from Africa via Europe to China. We had many of these extremely long haul flights, meaning that the patient will be in Epi shuttle for more than 20 hours. Our company's focus has always been long haul flights and that was not different during the pandemic. So I think that experience might be particularly interesting for you since it's a very different setting compared with short helicopter transports or short ground transports and um, generates different challenges the device has to deal with. So this relatively young male with normal dimensions um, had no underlying conditions, sustained COVID four days ago, um, showed typical symptoms such as fatigue, loss of taste and smell, um, he had fever and for one day um, he had some respiratory problems uh, with increasing desaturation, higher oxygen demands and was currently maintained on 8 liters per minute for a saturation of 93%, slightly tachypneic or at least borderline with the hemodynamics still stable. He was awake and oriented and uh, in command of Chinese language only. So we usually send out these comprehensive clinical information sheets to be completed um, by the treating team we get the patient from um, in order to get the full picture and make all the necessary preparations. So the challenges of this mission, um, we had an ultra long haul transport leaving us from South Africa via North Africa, Europe, Kazakhstan, finally to China. The patient was already showing borderline oxygen demands um, and by Dalton's law, meaning that the partial pressure of oxygen will continue to decrease on cruising altitude, um, an increase in oxygen demands um, had to be expected. The patient was prone to agitation and stress due to the encapsulation within a PMIU for so many hours and uh, 20 hours and more um, is quite a long time for an ICU patient, so we can also be facing disease progression. One further challenge was that the patient was in command of the Chinese language only. So um, this endangers uh, communication and endangers patient compliance, enhances anxiety, and this is also a challenge one has to deal with. Um, this case was a tarmac takeover, meaning that we, we took the patient in front of the aircraft. We placed two peripheral lines. Um, it was decided to go without an arterial line on the spot. We placed a Foley catheter, which is absolutely mandatory for these flights. We stowed light food and water within the shuttle. We also had a walkie talk, we also use regularly use walkie talkies, which was not of much use here because the patient was in command of Chinese language only. But sometimes you can also try to calm down people with a soothing voice in your mother tongue as well, and it will work pretty well. Um, in this case, the patient was able to board the aircraft on his own. We increased his oxygen a bit and he was able to climb the stairs. Um, so he lied down on the stretcher part of the shuttle and when connected to the monitoring and the two IV lines, the lid was finally closed and the shuttle disinfected from the outside. Um, the flight went relatively eventless. After the first fuel stop in Egypt, the patient became restless and uneasy. Therefore, we applied continuous low dose propofol, in this case, approximately one milligram per kilogram, which yeah, basically solved the issue for this patient. Um, Moreover, sedation economized the oxygen consumption, so we could even decrease the oxygen to six liters per minute despite flying on normal cruising altitude. And despite the fact that the patient was in command of Chinese only, 
we were able to establish a certain communication by tablet and mobile phone translator. Um, and this was because Epishat is a fully transparent lid, um, offers excellent visibility from the outside as well as from the inside. And this proves extremely helpful in this matter. So if not sedated, patients can clearly see the therapeutic team that very much helps to establish trust <clears throat> and um, to prevent anxiety. This is um, how the in-flight setting actually looks. Note that the med crew can completely work without wearing PPE, which is enormously beneficial on a long haul transport. And you can see visual monitoring um, of the patient is excellent. <clears throat> the workspace can be very well organized. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so um, the summary of this first case, um, in our experience, long haul transports of patients, both with minor impairment or critically ill, can be conducted safely and comfortably within Epi Shuttle. We have a fully transparent cover, which is enormously helpful. We have enough space, powerful air circulation. We have an easy and straightforward management of cables, lines and hoses, a very good accessibility. Um, patients can be positioned if needed, if the patient cannot position themselves. Of course, this is with limitations, mainly due to their own body dimensions. Um, and the same applies to nursing care, which is um, possible, certainly with limitations, but definitely possible. The insertion port, which is in the middle part of the shuttle, allows inserting and removing certain items. We have a high quality impression of the device that creates assurance and has a comforting effect. And the crew does not have to wear PPE, um, which is extremely helpful um, given on the many hours we spend with the patients. And it's also very reasonable from an ecological point of view. This is a map of the um, PMIU missions we conducted just to give you an idea um, of the distances we covered. So we had many of these long haul transports from the African continent, even North America, some from South America and Asia. Um, so we were able to um, get a lot of experience with these um, long haul transports. Now, um, as a second example, I would like to give you the um, example of transporting an extremely critically ill patient with an Epi shuttle. Uh, so this patient was ventilated, sedated, dependent on various vasoactive substances. And this is uh, to depict that very invasively treated patients can be safely transported. This 70 year old lady, slightly overweight, obese, um, with uh, several underlying conditions, had COVID for already 10 days, um, was in a critical phase of the disease, was already intubated and ventilated on quite escalated settings um, in terms of ventilation pressures as well as the FiO2 necessary. So we had a vasopressor in a quite high dose. Uh, we had an inotrope running already, um, sedation with fentanyl and midazolam, central line, arterial line in place, and a tracheal tube closed suction, nasogastric sonde, and a Foley catheter. So the challenges of that mission, um, undoubtedly the profound respiratory and hemodynamic instability uh, we were facing. So um, this is a patient in multi-organ failure, which is already on escalated ICU th uh, therapy, offering very limited potential for further escalation. We had many lines, cables and hoses that had to be managed very carefully. This time it was a bed to bed transfer. So we took over the patient in the isolation room in the ICU in Yerevan. Um, the patient was then transferred inside the room to the Epi Shuttle stretcher. Um, then we gave the patient some time to adjust to our transport ventilator, the Hamilton T1, and a few adjustments um, had to be made, which is not uncommon when taking the patient from a hospital ventilator on the Hamilton. After approximately 15 to 20 minutes, uh, the lid could be closed. The shuttle was disinfected from the outside, all within the isolation room in the hospital. 
and afterwards no more PPE or isolation procedures were necessary. So we've basically transported the shuttle through the halls of the hospital into the ambulance car without having to wear any PPE and without having to isolate the patient anymore, but with the PMIU he was already in. The third med crew member had uh, stayed behind with the flight crew. They had already prepared the ramp, which I showed you earlier, and um, the patient was able to board uneventfully um, the aircraft. This is not a picture from this actual mission because the um, disinfection process apparently took place in the hospital, um, but this is just to show you how it works. So we have two people wearing full PPE that were people in contact with the patient. And then we have one member of the med crew handing in disinfectants, um, handing in any items that are needed um, for the contaminated people to work with. And this has proven quite effective from an hygienic point of view. And um, yeah, we made the experience that it is quite difficult to do if you don't have this third person with you that can always uh, hand you important uh, things and items of your equipment. Yeah, this is what the in-flight setting looks like with a ventilated patient. So uh, as we saw earlier, we have the ventilation uh, hose here from the right lower part of the shuttle. Um, the, we have the IV medication running with the pumps there and the lights uh, enter the shuttle from the left lower part and are connected um, to the IV axis to the central line in this um, patient. Um, yeah, regarding the flight, uh, one has to say that the patient continued her downward spiral um, with increasing hemodynamic instability. Um, so norepinephrine had to be increased, epinephrine even started, so dobutamine was discontinued. A fluid resuscitation was inevitable in this case. Um, it was unsure whether we were facing superinfection of the COVID um, pneumonia or if we had an additional septic shock of some other etiology. Um, in Hamburg, um, finally, um, the deboarding went uneventfully. The epi shuttle was mounted on the striker stretcher of the ambulance from the fire department of Hamburg and the handover. Um, was done in the emergency room of the university hospital. There it was decided that the patient should go to um, medical imaging immediately. So we transferred the patient uh, to the CAT scan um, inside Epi Shuttle, so through the halls of Hamburg University Hospital. And it was there in the radiology department finally that the lid was lifted and the patient taken out of isolation um, and medical imaging was done. In the end, unfortunately, but yeah, as was to be expected, despite ECMO insertion, the patient did not really survive the next days. In our view, AP shuttle is especially suited for critically ill patients dependent on hemodynamic and respiratory support. And this is due to the intelligent and reliable construction with regard to the insertion of cables, lines, and hoses. We have multiple gloves that grant excellent accessibility of the patient and um, items and equipment parts can be easily handled. Um, one of the biggest achievements is that PPE for medical personnel is not necessary anymore. In our opinion, that enhances the quality of care enormously. The focus can remain on the patient um, it reduces transmission of germs, even within hospitals and wards, which was very, very well shown by that case. Um, so the hospital floors of the Yerevan Hospital, as well as uh, of the University Hospital of Hamburg, weren't exposed to this patient um, because uh, Epi Shuttle was closed in the actual room the patient um, was residing and was opened up in the CT in Hamburg um, Hospital. So the device actively contributed to um, prohibit any kind of transmission. Um, the construction of the shuttle facilitates clear arrangements, allows a constant direct observation of the patient, which is extremely um, beneficial and extremely important. 
And this is something not all the PMIUs on the market offer. Sometimes it's very difficult because of light reflexes and because of the use of um, certain material, it's very different to um, observe the patient directly, which is definitely an important part of monitoring, especially in the setting of air ambulance. And this um, is kind of the quintessence of everything. So our internal surveys uh, demonstrate a very high level of satisfaction from med crews. So our people, they feel safe with handling the shuttle and they trust the shuttle, they trust the construction, have high confidence in the device. And this is probably the most important point and probably the best award an isolation unit can receive uh, during a pandemic. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Um, I hope I could highlight some um, special characteristics that make EpiShuttle a highly suitable device um, for transporting patients on long haul and for transporting patients in very critical conditions. Thank you very much. Okay, so that were uh, all three of our presenters. Uh, despite the, some technical problems, we have managed <laughs> to share some experiences with you. Uh, we have got uh, some questions down here. So we'll see, we probably will take a few minutes to answer them. Uh, or we'll just uh, do that later on directly uh, via email. Um, Michael, would you take this one? Sure. We have a question regarding use of the hel of the Epi shuttle in the EC-145 uh, helicopters. <clears throat> we have, um, to sort of introduce, we have customer reports of use of the Epi shuttle in a lot of different types of aircraft, uh, lots of helicopters, lots of planes um, over the last few years. Um, one of uh, our customers who've used the Epi shuttle a lot are DRF in Germany. It's a uh, DRF Luftrettung, and they use the Epi shuttle in the in the EC-145 helicopter. Um, and as as part of their solution, what they have done is that they have developed a a plate that the Epi shuttle sits on, um, and then we use uh, our Epi shuttle striker adapter um, to mount directly onto that plate. Um, DRF have that plate commercially available for customers who would like to to purchase that from them directly, and we. Of course, um, willing and glad to share um, contact details um, there. It's a, it's a good solution, uh, safe, and uh, and they're very happy with that themselves. Thank you, Michael. There was one more question about uh, uh, which personal protective equipment is being used, but I think we will redirect this question to our panelists and uh, then uh send an answer directly um first of all i would like to say thank you for having uh these two hours to listen uh about the use of the epi shuttle we uh, shared today the experience from three countries and we are planning to do that uh more because we have many users a lot around the world and uh, it is always interesting to to share their experience and uh, to, to be able to see more of the Epi Shuttle use cases. Uh, so please, in the end of the webinar, you will receive a link for a survey. Uh, if you have ideas or questions or would like to suggest a topic for the next webinar, or there is something that you would like to see next time, share with us. We're going to take it into consideration. And uh, of course, we're going to get back to you. So have uh, um, uh, we will maintain communication. And uh, Michael maybe wants to wrap up this uh, webinar with the final speech. It'll be a very short speech. I want to thank everybody for joining. It's, uh, it was a pleasure to see so many people uh, watch and, and listen. Um, you know, uh, Nick Spence said at the beginning that he didn't trust us, but he wanted to uh, well, trust and verify. Um, and I think that's why we, we think it's important to share our customer stories 
um, with, with you. I hope it's useful to, to learn from them. Um, and please also share your stories uh, with us, uh, with our other customers, because I think it will be better if we all learn from each other. So uh, with that, thank you very much. Appreciate your time and uh, have a lovely day thank or you. night. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Bye.